represents uh, John Moore with uh, Schroeder. And the title of the talk is Inferential Expressionism Foundations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, so um, the title is Inferential Expressionism Foundations because what we are planning to do in UNI in this talk and the next is to present. Uh, to give an overview of inferential expressivism and of the book uh, they were currently completing, which is called Reasoning with Attitude uh, uh, Foundations and Applications of Inferential Expressivism. So I'll tell you about the foundations and Dylan will tell you about uh, the applications, although some applications will actually also come up uh, in this talk. Okay. Um, so the plan is to start uh, from expressivism and inferentialism, so I'll start presenting uh, the two views in a very traditional way, so very traditional versions of the view, and I'll highlight uh, some key problems, or all the problems, but uh, what are sometimes taken to be the key problems for the uh, two views respectively, so the privilege each problem on the one hand for expressivism and what I would call the problem of limited applicability and the problem of effective concepts for inferentialism, and then we move on to inferential expressivism, which can be regarded as a view that combines expressivism and inferentialism, and the claim for, and, you know, hopefully the result is that um, uh, by combining the two views, the two, you know, the major problems of expressivism and inferentialism can be addressed. And then uh, I'll present inferential expressivism by focusing on the case of negation. And then I'll move on uh, to the case of epistemic models and hopefully this time to the case of, of probability. So how to, um, to give inferential expressivist accounts. So there we are. Uh, so, you know, obviously <laughs> in this kind of audience to say what expressivism is, is kind of, you know, it's always problematic, but I'll focus here on traditional expressivism, so very traditional version of it, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> version that nobody probably holds anymore, but uh, I think it's good to start from there because, uh, because, you know, in, in certain ways, traditional expressivism, so inferential expressivism is actually closer to traditional expressivism than more recent versions of expressivism. And we will uh, think of, of traditional expressivism as combining semantic and metasemantic elements, so on the uh, semantic side, we'll take, uh, uh, we take traditional expressivism to have a negative component and a positive component. On the negative side, the idea is that terms receiving expressive treatment do not have a referential semantic bias. So this is what uh, I call the no referential semantics thesis. And on the positive side, the idea is that terms receiving expressive treatment indicate the expression of an attitude. So the paradigmatic case, of course, <laughs> is moral expressivism. <laughs> and the idea is that writing line is wrong is analyzed as frowning M, where, uh, where, where the frowning indicates the expression of this angle <laughs> and M stands for line. Okay. So now we move to the meta semantic side. And again, here we can see traditional expressivism as having, uh, as endorsing a negative and a positive. Uh, thesis. On the negative side, moral statements do not express beliefs, and so the constitutive function is not to describe how things are in the world. And on the positive side, then the idea is that the function of moral statement is to express non cognitive attitudes. And now, having presented traditional expressivism in this way, already allows me to uh, talk about the what I what we call the pragmatist razor. So and so the pragmatist razor. Uh, says that you should avoid semantic expressions <coughs> that are not needed for account for the functional role of an expression or sentence. So if you look at the uh, metasemantic uh, ideas in traditional expressivism, then you, you know, there are some claims made at the functional role. And then given the, and then if you look at the semantic thesis, you see that you know, the view really complies with the pragmatist razor here, because basically the kind of the Semantic really, you know, just only appeals in effect to the kind of function that is recognized as a meta semantic. So. But of course, you know, <laughs> we know that there's the, 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 the frigging each problem. There are several versions of the problem in the literature. One that I will uh, just mention briefly is the negation version here. I'll focus on the conditional version of the problem. So the one that uh, uh, 
you know, you know, that's the original one that we find in both Frege and Nietzsche. So here we have the argument uh, cast for the case uh, of morality. So we have, uh, so the argument says that if line is wrong, it should be punished. Line is wrong, a line should be punished. And the main problem, though, is that in the antecedent from uh, cannot be taken to express the attitude of disapproval because that sentence could be acted sincerely and coherently by somebody that doesn't disapprove of line. And then you might say that, oh, well, then it's just when it's not embedded that uh, the wrong expresses disapproval. But then the problem says, Frege, you know, you can't, you know, you can't validate the argument by modus ponens as it seems you should. Okay. Okay, now just a brief slide. So this is going to be extremely quick just to say, you know, what happened after that. So expressivists became sophisticated. So, and they reject this, you know, the kind of simple minded version of, of expressivism that I, that I uh, presented earlier. So they rejected the other terms versus an expressivist treatment, merely indicate expression of an attitude. Uh, so we have, uh, of course, people, and Blackburn, and here there are issues with the negation version of the Frankish problem. So our contention is that we can, you know, deal with that as, as well and better than they can. And then there are hybrid versions of the of the view that can be seen as rejecting the negative thesis of traditional expressivism. So an utterance of language is wrong expresses disapproval of things. I mean, the property, the speaker takes to be denoted by wrong. That's you know at least one way of cashing it out. So one issue that I you know, that we have with that is that the free teach in science is that if line is wrong, it should be punished. You not express disapproval of anything at all. You know, so in a way you're not, you know, you're not fully, fully, fully <laughs> getting to the heart of the problem. Uh, if you still say that there's some, some disapproval that's already expressed, it's not the kind of disapproval that the traditional expressives want to have, but it's still seems that you're not getting to, to the heart of the problem. Okay, so this is the dogmatic presentation of expressivism. Now I move on to the dogmatic presentation of inferentialism. And again, here we can start from that very traditional version of the view. So this is the view that goes back to Gensen famously. And the idea here is that the semantic value of a logical constant is given by its inferential role as captured by a set of inference rules representing how declarative sentences containing the logical constant as the main operator may be introduced or eliminated. So the famous, you know, the case that we always use because we want to make our life easy is that of conjunction. So uh, uh, the meaning of conjunction is, is given by the fact that from A and B individually, you can infer A and B, and from A and B, you can infer A and you can infer B. So generalizing this, we have a semantic thesis, which is the semantic value of an expression is given by its process and inferences. Okay. Now, one thing that I think that it's happened, has happened in recent times is that inferentialism has come to be understood often as a meta-semantic thesis. So in particular, um, typically as a thesis concerning what determines the meaning of an expression rather than what gives the meaning of an expression. So, so the idea here is that the semantic value of an expression is determined by its inferential role rather than, than given by it. So the idea here is that what we're doing, we are reversing the typical referential order of semantic explanation. So on the refer, you know, this is this, this is terminology of semantics program and post-semantics that, that uh, is used by McFarlane, which is very uh, useful here that, you know, on the referentialist camp, you start by assigning semantic values to uh, substantial components, and then you say how those assignments determine the semantic value of things that are more complex. And after you've done that, you define logical truth and validity. Now, for the inferentialists that at the, uh, at the metasemantic level, that's, you know, this, this terminology of post-semantics in some way is a misnomer because you start from um, legitimate inference and then and then, on the, and then that's what determines what the meanings are. So the order of semantic explanation is reversed. But still, the determination thesis is in principle compatible with, with referentialism, which I take it as being one of the motivations for going metasemantics that in a way we can, you know, have leave formal semantics, standard formal semantics alone, but still say something about the, the level of meaning determination. 
But still, to then get from the level of semantic determination to the level of semantic values, we need an assumption that connects the domain of proper inference with the domain of reference. So for instance, the typical thing we might say is that proper inference preserves truth. And then that allows you to move from the level of um, meaning determination to, to the level, from the level of inference to the level of you know, referential semantic values. The, there are issues though here because, um, because this version of the view at least faces Kanna's problem. It faces the problem that, you know, there are, you know, at least if you focus on standard versions, say, of the propositional calculus, you get non standard interpretation. So if you stick just at the level of, of conjunction, it's fine. If, if you have the standard rules for conjunction, then you're going to have that conjunction, you know, the, the mean of you know, the semantic value uh, of conjunction has got to be that, uh, the one given by the truth table. The standard truth table for conjunction. But already, if you move to the level of disjunction on people of negation, you have no standard interpretation. For instance, you can have a valuation where both a negation and uh, both a sentence and its negation are true. Now, as it happens, bilateralism <laughs> uh, solves this problem at the level of the propositional connectives. But if you then move to the level of the quantifiers, that's not so clear already. So then the question is. Why is this the move from the inferential determination thesis to the semantic thesis of inferentials? And I mean, I want to hear because, you know, uh, so there are people that are interested here in uh, uh, inferentialism as a method semantic thesis. Of, uh, I'd like to hear maybe there are there's some arguments that we're missing, but, you know, there are two in the literature. One is Damet's argument, uh, which I read. Damet says logical constants figure equally in non-sectoric sentences. The means of the logical constants cannot be full consist in the world in adaptive inferences. They must have meanings of a more general kind, whereby they contribute to the meanings of sentences containing them, just as other words do. So Damit here, so our response here, Damit is absolutely right. The logical constants figure equally in asteroid sentences. But it's wrong to conclude from that that the meanings of the logical constants do not consist in, in, in their own adaptive inferences. That follows only if you assume a very restrictive view of what adaptive inference consists in, <coughs> in asteroid sentences. That that's the view that the differential expressiveness rejects. And so, the, and, and so that, that doesn't follow. Okay. The other argument is probably, you know, conservatism. You know, we want, again, as I said, we want to leave referential semantics alone. But, you know, when I am in a revolutionary mood, I want to say, you know, the inferentialist is doing something that has semantic relevance for semantics. And they should, you know, they should reclaim the successes that they are having as successes at the level of semantics. Okay, but there are problems for differentialism too. So one is the problem of defective concepts, but it's famous problem that as prior pointed out, uh, uh, we can uh, consider a connected tongue that, uh, that uh, has the following rules. From A, you can infer A top B, and from A top B, you can infer B. So as prior said, tongue is around about inference tickets. So from any A, you can infer any B. Whatsoever, and prior concluded that that sinks logical inferentialism. And the way inferentialists responded was by um, historically saying, no, 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 we should place constraints on the acceptability of uh, uh, sets of inference rules. But the problem, famously, is that then, well, if you want to say classical logic at this, is that harmony appears, appears to sanctions. Uh, the, the, the following point is ruled out. Intuitionistic logic is ruled in, but then classical logic is, appears to be ruled out. Okay. And the other problem is the problem of limited applicability. So the problem that it seems that inferentialists have focused on the case of the co-logical concepts. And then the question is, oh, but can the view really aspire to say something about other expressions in the language? So, so here there's a quote from Williamson that says, if you want to the theory of how some particular linguistic construction contributes to the meanings of sentences in which it occurs, the inferentialist is unlikely to have one. So Williamson is, of course, <laughs> not uh, a friend of inferentialism, but also people that are that are inferentialists themselves, like Greg Restor, rightly say that you know inferentialists must do better, as Williamson would put it. So we need from them more work on the range of applications in the theory meaning for speech acts 
beyond the session and concepts beyond the core logical constants. Okay. okay, so we have you know the frigate each problem on the table, and we have the problem of applicability and the problem of uh, effective concepts. Okay, and now we move uh, to inferential expressivism, and I'll start uh, here from uh, Hugh Price, uh, who uh, we discussed yesterday. So Price argues that we need a primitive operation to register a perceived incompatibility. So Price considers our community the ideological positivists, and they do not have uh, negation. And then, and then Price argues that you know they, they you go into you know such a community would be you know uh, would ultimately face the need for an operator like negation to register a perceived incompatibility. For instance, for register to register the perceived incompatibility of Fred uh, being in the garden with him being in the kitchen. So the, you want to have something that ties with the thread cannot be <laughs> in, the, in the same place. And then price takes rejection to express incompatibility and so negation indicates rejection. So in a way, at this stage, at least the view seems uh, a form of traditional expressivism about uh, negation. So this is a view we find in price, uh, but we also find it in purse, you know, there are differences here, so I'm, I'm simplifying, of course, but we find it in purse, Ramsey, Sellers, Blackwell, and Brandon. So this, you know, it's not a coincidence, perhaps, that these are all pragmatists, or, you know, Cambridge pragmatists, that they are sometimes called an American pragmatists. Oh, and then Price also says that an analogous argument for the need, uh, can be given for the need of a primitive attitude of so the kind of argument that it gives for the need for a primitive uh, uh, operation of rejection, so speech act of rejection also, there's also a similar need for a primitive attitude of this belief. So then we have here, yeah, uh, you know, full blown version of traditional expressism about negation, so ne negation expresses this belief. Um, and, you know, here we see an application of the pragmatist razor in the way Price argues, because we start from a story about the functional role of negation, and then we move to a claim about the meaning of negation. So this is this is a version of the pragmatist way. Okay, but of course, again, you know, the Frege Gitch is going to arise in this context. And in fact, when Frege originally presented the Frege Gitch problem, he presented it as a problem concerning, uh, you know. What we would now call expressivist accounts uh, of negation. So, and this is in fact pretty much uh, Frege's example. Uh, if the accused, if the accused was not in Berlin, he did not commit the murder. The accused was not in Berlin, he did not. Hence, he did not commit the murder. So, again, for, for similar reasons as before, not they're not functional here as a false indicator, but then if you say that in, in the unimpeded case, it still functions as a false indicator, then you can't argue for the conclusion by those points. Now, price actually is interesting because then I said, oh, this seems a version of traditional expressism of negation, but actually then in the end, it is not so. He says that he's, set, that, that he's setting aside a venerable uh, objection to the kind of account that is given uh, in his paper. But, but, but then he goes on to say that the Frege argument is powerless if you allow a negative statement to perform both a rejection and the assertion or negation. So these things kind of a hybrid, uh, a form of hybrid expressivism about negation. Um, and you know, the kind of reservations that I expressed earlier also apply. Okay, and so this, all of this paves the way to bilateralism, which is the view that the meaning of an expression is given by conditions on assertion and, re and rejection. So negation does not indicate rejection. Negation is an operator, all right? But negation, so the meaning of negation is inferentially explained in terms of rejection. So we let here the plus, uh, stand for assertion and the minus stand for rejection. So these are false markers, and then you give the meaning of negation by saying that from the rejection of A, you can infer the assertion of not A and vice versa, and that from the assertion of A, you can infer the rejection of not A and vice versa. Okay. 
Okay, now palatialism is a form of logical inferentialism. That's how it's typically understood in the literature. And that's true, of course, because you take the meaning of the logical constants to be given by uh, the inferential role. But we claim that palatialism is also a form of inferential expressivism in that the minimum negation is inferentially explained in terms of rejection, which expresses this belief. So this is, this, this we claim provides in a way a template for the kind of uh, semantic analysis that then the inferential expressivist can provide. Okay, there's one thing that we still need to, um, to, um, to uh, vindicate prices playing the rejection uh, serves to has this uh, function uh, of uh, indicating incompatibility. And so we need to ensure that the rejection expresses incompatibility. And this is done by so called coordination principles that serve that do not give the meaning of specific operators, but serve to coordinate the speech acts. So we have that uh, it's absurd to assert and reject the same sentence, and that if the supposition that A is asserting this absurdity, then the speaker is committed to rejecting A and similarly for the other principle. So if we have the, the asserted conjunction rules, so we take the standard rules for conjunction, we stick a plus in front of them, uh, and we have the rules for negation that I shown, and these rules, then we get classical logic on the assertive front. Okay, so what's the solution to the pre ditch problem? Well, not does not indicate rejection. So, so this holds in, in both if the accused was not believed <coughs> commit the murder and yeah, and the accused was only believed, and the conclusion follows by both exponents then. Nevertheless, the mean negation is explained in terms of rejection and constant across contexts. Okay. So, so in the book, we focus on two dimensions on speech acts. So we take speech acts to have two dimensions. So we focus on the attitude that they express and their essential effects on the conversation. So assertion expresses belief and rejection expresses disbelief. Now, as we will see, and you know, also when we move to the case of with rejection, as Imogen pointed out, you know, this can be generalized to others, you know, the case of rejection for the speech acts, but outside the better time. And then the essential effect of an assertion is a proposal to update the common ground, as you know, uh, uh, as is traditionally taken uh, uh, in the, uh, in, you know, in the by Stonecker. But we then take the essential effect of a rejection to be a proposal to update the negative common ground. So in a way, we, we want to make the common ground bilateral as well. So that's what, what we have to say. Okay, and now this is the general. Uh, thesis of, of inferential expressivism at the semantic level, but the semantic value of a term is given by the inferential relation for an attitude expression towards a sentence containing the term best or the attitude expressions in virtue of the fact that the sentence contains the term. So for instance, because this is <laughs> it's, it's difficult to pass, the semantic value not is given by the inferential relation an assertion or rejection of a sentence containing not but to other assertions or rejections in virtue of the fact that the sentence contains not. So among other things, for instance, the fact that, you know, from the assertion uh, of not A, you can infer the rejection of not A, this is part of what determines the meaning. So it keeps the meaning of not. Okay, at the level of inference, we take legitimate inference to preserve commitment. So attitude expressions explicitly commit speakers to having certain attitudes. So when you express an attitude, you explicitly commit yourself to having certain attitude. And then the meaning conferring inferential relations between attitude ex expressions unpack the further attitudes one is committed to. So there are some attitudes that you explicitly commit uh, yourself to when you, when you make a speech act. And then there are some other attitudes, expressions you are committed to. So, to give a, an example, when you, when you assert A and B, you are committing uh, yourself to believing A and B, but you're also committing yourself you know, to, you know, to uh, assert it to which are clustering if there's such a thing. Okay, at the meta semantic level, uh, uh, we take inferential expressivism to
to endorse a thesis about the functional role of, um, of uh, terms that, that receive unfunctional expressive treatment. In particular, we take the functional role of terms receiving inferential expressive treatment to register commitments to certain attitudes. And then by the pragmatist razor, then the semantic thesis of inferential expressivism follows, or at least if you don't want to say something, something as strong as that, at least this is clear that the semantic thesis of inferential expressivism complies with the pragmatist ways of once you endorse these functional movements. Uh, just, just because we want to be the target of lots of objections, we also endorse uh, thesis concerning uh, meaning knowledge. So we take meaning to be determined by inferential relations between attitude expressions, and we take meaning knowledge to consist in knowledge of these relations. Okay. Now, how are assertion and rejection realized? Because you might say, well, you know, note, note does not indicate rejection. So it just should be, is it an act of faith now to believe in the existence of speech act of rejection? Well, what bilateralists typically say is that rejection can be realized by answers to self, to self pose polar questions. So uh, uh, yes, that indicates assertion and no indicates rejection. So is it the case that A, yes, that realizes the assertion of A, and we saw that that's denoted by plus A. Is it the case that A, no, that realizes a rejection of A, and so that that's uh, denoted by minus A? Is it the case that not A, <coughs> yes, that realizes the assertion of not A, uh, which is denoted by plus not A? And so, the, uh, in particular, the important point is that although um, rejection and negative assertion are interderivable, they shouldn't be, you know, they should be distinguished, they're not the same. Okay, and then Imogen. I pointed out in a wonderful paper uh, some years ago that some rejections are weak. So the, the first two examples are examples that uh, she gave. The third one is unfamiliar, you know, and I gave and it's based on rice. Uh, did Homer write the Iliad? No, Homer did not exist. Was Homer unicorn? No, there is no such thing as a unicorn with X relation, no, X or Y. It wins. So these rejections are weak in the sense that. Uh, uh, a negative assertion, you know, from these rejections, a negative assertion doesn't follow. You should infer, it would be a mistake to infer. Okay. So then, this then uh, proposal is to then move, move to a multilateralist uh, setting where, and so we need to say something about weak rejection. So there are two things which attitude is expressed and what's the essential effect on the conversation. Uh, at the attitude level, we say that in the objective A, one expresses one's refraining from believing that A. And so in so doing, then one also prevents a common ground update. Okay. Then smiling reductio is valid for rejections that can be weak. And so if we let the circle minus be assigned for weak rejection, then the, the Following rules are going to preserve commitment because remember that we are understanding inference in terms of commitment preservation. So the, the assertion of A and the rejection of A lead to absurdity. And if the assertion of A is absurdity, then, a, uh, then the speaker is committed to weakly rejecting A. And if the supposition that A is weakly rejecting this absurdity, then the speaker is committed to asserting A. Okay, then, but, but then there the seems to be a problem because, of course, weak rejections do not validate the bilateral initial rules. That's almost by definition, right? Uh, but strong rejections do. So we still have now strong rejections around. So we have, we now restrict the uh, uh, minus symbol to strong rejections, which is, you know, in the way, that's the way that it was historically used by bilateralists. But then we still have a problem because we have a problem that minor reductio seems to be invalid for some rejection. So if it is, suppose, if it, suppose that it is absurd for the speaker to assert Homer wrote the Iliad on, uh, because they have evidence for the fact that Homer did not exist, it would be, you know, it would be wrong to conclude from that that they are committed to Homer 
should not exist, at least if that is a suitable internal neg negation, you must say, oh, that's an external negation, but you know, the can be, this kind of case can be run uh, with other examples. So nothing you know, hinges here on, uh, on how you treat proper names, really. That's just Okay, so, so what we do is then we restrict uh, the smiling reductio rules to get, in the case where you want to get a strong rejection, so we, we're talking about smiling reductio star principles, which together with the strong rejection rule then preserve community. So here we have the strong rejection principles as, as before, so the assertion of A and the strong rejection of A that that's absurd to perform these two speech acts at the same time. But now, here yeah, we have that from the fact that the supposition that is a certain means of absurdity, uh, you can conclude the strong rejection of, of A only if the motivation of absurdity preserves and So here, I don't have quite <laughs> um, the time to explain why, the, the, why that works, but you know, uh, you can talk about it, you know, trust me for now, okay? And so then in the propositional case, uh, failures of evidence preservation may only arise because of the presence uh, of weak rejection. So as Imogen pointed out, uh, you know, weak rejections are, uh, you know, gives rise to unspecificity. So because one can reject, you know, on, 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 at the point what it means is that one can reject on the basis of, of different kinds of evidence, you know, evidence for the negation, of a proposition or a sentence, but also evidence that the one that doesn't have evidence and so on. So what we do then in this case, we take uh, uh, failure of evidence preservation to consist in the presence of uh, weak rejections as premises. So then shall we have a formal version of this minor reduction style principles that <coughs> concludes a strong rejection here if you know premise is signed with uh, the uh, false market for weak rejection where you derive bottom. Okay. And, then, and then here. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so, so then we uh, have a system at this point that we call basic multilateral logic which consists of the bilateral negation rules, the asserted conjunction rules, the coordination principles, and the coordination principles task, that is the coordination principles that are suitably restricted. And then the theorem is that this logic validates all classically valid arguments. So if A is a logical consequence of gamma in classical propositional logic, then the result of putting a class in front of A is derivable in the logic from the result of putting uh, a plus in front of each member of government. Okay, but nonetheless, some classical meta rules fail. So the logic is classical at the inferential level, but it's not classical at the meta inferential level. So reductive inferences fail. But this failure can only arise in the presence of inference for certain which do not present evidence. So only if you have weak rejections around. So the evidence preserving fragment of the proof theory is truly classical. Okay, so so far we have looked at the case uh, of assertion rejection. We looked at weak rejections, and now we move to the case of weak assertion and epistemic models. Okay, but first let me uh, uh, say how we have what's emerging here is a multilateral methodology uh, for. Uh, explaining uh, the meaning uh, of an expression in inferential expressive terms. So to inferentially explain the meaning of a linguistic item in terms of an attitude expression, we must identify the linguistic realization of this expression. So for instance, no, yes, uh, as we said, you know, no and yes answers to follow questions. That's what we talked about so far. Expand the coordination principles so as to specify how this attitude expression interacts with other attitude expressions. So once you have another attitude expression in your system, you need to say how that's going to interact with the other speech acts that you have around. Lay down rules that could define the inferential relations between the linguistic acting and the attitude expression. So this is, for instance, what we did you know, in the case of rejection, we gave the rules for negation in terms of rejection, 
And then determine which new inferences preserve evidence to appropriately restrict the coordination principles. Star. So that's what that's what we did. You know, when we started having reprojection around. So then we so how once you have reprojections around, how you need to restrict this manual reduction. Okay, and then so now this is going to be um, very quick because I mean, as I said, you know, I want to give an overview of uh, of how uh, you know of some applications. So there's a version of uh, of traditional expressism about might. You know, there are, I mean, again, here are, uh, you know, there are differences between the views, but I'm knowing those. But the idea is that the general idea is that might does not describe but expresses one's existing state. And the purported advantage of this view is that it predicts the infelicity of the ill sentences, so if semi contradictions, uh, so sentences of the form P and my uh, P that not P, and explains the phenomenon of modal disagreement. So it explains the fact that when, uh, when Ali says the keys might be in the car and Bob says, no, I checked there in the drawer, they seem to be disagreeing, but if you are a standard contextualist and you take uh, might to express compatibility with a certain body of knowledge, and as we try not to, 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 to express to, you know, to, uh, to describe compatibility with a certain set of knowledge, then you, know, you, you have to struggle to uh, predict that this, should, that this should be a case of disagreement at all. So this is all good, but of course you have the Friedrich problem here as well, because might can embed in conditional antecedents, so I'm not going to go through the motions, but it's easy to see that you can run the Friedrich Hitch argument just as before. So what we do now is that we introduce a speech act of weak assertion, which is realized by perhaps answers to follow questions and expresses once uh, at the level of attitude, it, it expresses once refraining from disbelieving that A and at the level of essential effect on, on the conversation, it, it prevents a negative coming round of it. Okay. And so now we have the multilateral square of opposition. So we have from the assertion here, we have which uh, weak assertion, which is subattempt to it, from rejection here, and we project subattempt from rejection, and then strong assertion is from rejection of countries, and then weak assertion is from rejection of contradictory, and similar from, from assertion and rejection. So that's the picture. And then the meaning of might is then can, can be given by two sets of rules. Uh, so explaining again, uh, we, 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 what, we, what we do, we explain the meaning of might in terms of uh, weak assertion. So we uh, let circle plus start for, for weak assertion and the diamond start for might. And then we have two, uh, in, a set of introduction initial rules that ensures that perhaps it is raining and might be raining are inferentially equivalent, which means that one can be uh, derived from the other. And similarly, for perhaps it might be raining and perhaps it is raining. Okay. And now we have one last step to make because we need to say how to restrict the coordination principle style. And what we're going to do is we design our weekly set of premises and the use of diagonal diminution rules in the combination principles. And then the resulting system, uh, EML, extends S5. So if it proves anything, S5 proves but and more. And it validates all substitution instances of classically valid argument in the language of modern logic. But you know, as before, though, uh, at the meta inferential level, the system is not classical, so some meta inferences were uh, failed, but you know, <laughs> you know, we that's the price to pay for extending <laughs> S5. Otherwise, you get well, the otherwise that's not, but typically you get a multiple color. Okay. So the meaning of might is then given by the inference rule for diamond. So just to put things in, in inferential expressive terms, the rules specify which attitude expressions the speaker is committed. Uh, two in strongly weakly asserting diamond A and when they are committed to these speech acts. And this is, this is going to predict the infelicity of the single sentences because they're going to be contradictions. 
explains the phenomenon of model disagreement, but we claim it's called fabrication. Okay. Do I have time to go for probability? Five minutes. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so now we're going to talk about <coughs> probability. So we are going to introduce a further speech act, the speech act of moderate assertion. So the speech act of moderate assertion is realized by probably answers to all the questions at the level of attitudes that expresses the strong partial belief that A. So for now, so we don't, do not understand strong partial belief in a way uh, that we are you know, taught <laughs> to, you know, in terms of, you know, in a numerical creed, you know, it's not, that's, that's, that's not what we have in mind. We don't have in mind something quantitative, we have in mind something qualitative. And, and then in performing a moderate assertion, you make a tentative proposal to add a to the product. I think to get an idea here, we want to get uh, how, how, the, how the speech act behaves. We need is useful to think about the differences and similarities with strong unit assertion. Like in the case of strong assertion, if you moderately assert A and you moderately assert not A, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's incoherent or, or inconsistent. So that's like, you know, kind of, that's like strong assertion. Um, and that fits with the fact that to make it, to make a tentative proposal to add A to the common ground and to make a tentative proposal to add not A to the common ground, that's inconsistent. But on the other hand, and like weak assertion, it's, you know, you can uh, to uh, moderately assert uh, a and you know and uh, and and weakly assert it, not a. That's fine. That's fine. So because you can you can, for instance, uh, because you can make a tentative proposal to add a to the common ground by refraining from adding, uh, you know. Uh, 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 while while I'm still thinking, while still limiting open roughly that no A might be added to the common ground. And here the analogy is useful, I think, is with the case uh, still thinking in the case of the square of opposition is with most. So roughly strong assertion behaves like all in the square of opposition, weak assertion behaves like some, moderate assertion behaves like most. So it's fine to, you know, is, you know, and, and most, you know, life is, is inconsistent to say all A's are B's and all A's are not B's. And similarly, you know, to, to say most A's are B's and most A's are not B's, that's bad. But, but to say most A's uh, uh, are B's and some A's are not B's, that's fine. And similarly, you know, uh, in, the, in the case of moderate uh, assertion. Okay. And so now we have, a multilateral hexagon uh, of the position. So and, okay, that's the picture. I, I, I won't go through the picture. I think it's nice that you're actually. Um, okay. Okay. And now, just this super, super quick, we can go on to lay down rules for uh, the triangle, which whose intended reading is it is probable that. Uh, in terms of the speech act on moderate assertion. So we are explaining it is probable that in terms of probably, roughly. And moreover, we can appropriately restrict the coordination principle stance. That turns out to be trickier uh, than, than we thought it would be initially. And the theory retains the advantages of traditional expressivism about probability we play while solving the Freddy Ditch problem. Uh, again, a final bit because I think that's. I bet that's what you're wondering. But what about first comparative probability uh, is as probable, uh, A is as probable as B. And what about numerical probability? Okay. For the first, we uh, can give an inferential expressive account of comparative probability. So we can start with a false, with a binary false marker, A, a no more probability than B, and explain A is a, B is at least as probable as A in terms of that. So Julian will say something more about binary force markers in the context of uh, conditions. But this is something that is also useful in the case of probability. And once you have that, once you have comparative pro pro probability, then you can give an account of numerical probability. Well, there are two things that we, that we could say. One is to say, to you know, <laughs> put your foot down and say they really, you know, there's other technical talk imported into everyday language, or there's something like, uh, you know, still something like 
you know, to be very, you know, that when people say, oh, uh, oh, I'm 90% sure that this is the case, you know, they're not really uh, expressing a perfect numerical probability, but rather saying, oh, I'm, I'm very confident about this. You know, and I think, you know, you know, for instance, my wife says that all the time, but it's like, oh no, but I disagree, I'm only 87%. Uh, Probability, so we can, and so we we can then appeal to representation here. So to say that you know maybe that's not something about uh, psychology, you know, having this uh, these credences, but you can, you know, they can be, you know, we have the mean, you know, we, it's useful to represent people in terms of credences once you have a comparative probability. So this is very sketchy, but that's what we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Thanks.